Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Imperial Class Star Destroyer House is just under 50,000 people. 9,235 officers, 27,850 enlisted personnel as crew, and a 9,700 strong Stormtrooper attachment. In a previous video concerning the logistics of the Imperial Class Star Destroyer, we compared the ship to Hoboken, also known as Miles City, a small town across the river from Manhattan, where inhabitants often tell people that they live in New York City. Which of course is a lie. They don't. Hoboken is a great comparison for an Imperial class Star Destroyer because both are roughly one mile in length and have similar population. The Star Destroyer has 50,000 people and Hoboken now has a population of 59,000. What I want to focus on today about the Imperial class Star Destroyer is an aspect of logistics and ship design that is oftentimes overlooked but is extremely important. Uh, some might call this field reverse logistics because it involves supplies being consumed by crew members and then ejected out of their bodies. We, of course, are talking about waste management. Interestingly enough, before Hoboken became the yuppie paradise it is today, it was predominantly a working class community with a lot of people in the waste management profession living there. In the late 19th century, Hoboken was actually known as a haven for German migrants. But after World War I, when sentiment soured towards the Germans, they kind of left. Italian immigrants and some Irish would move in and take their place. Uh, Frank Sinatra was born on Monroe Street. And they, along with a wave of Puerto Ricans who migrated around World War II, would basically work in the many factories and warehouses that dotted the uh, waterfront. Hoboken was also a major port back in the day. It was a key component in the logistical network of the metro region of New York City, and waves of goods and immigrants from across the Atlantic would arrive on Hoboken's waterfront. And so historical Hoboken was always a city uh, focused on lo logistics, at least until the port in Elizabeth opened and kind of took all that traffic away. Also, Hoboken's working class neighborhood uh, were made up of a lot of firemen and, and police officers who worked in the city, but, you know, commuted across the river. And you also have a lot of sanitation workers. And I'm not talking about like Tony Soprano style uh, waste management guys, but actual people who worked in that profession. And so that makes Hoboken kind of the uh, perfect city to compare to an Imperial class Star Destroyer when you're taking a look at these type of logistical questions. So what are Hoboken's waste management needs? Well, it's kind of similar to an ISD because of the shared population, and it's also surprisingly complex, even if it isn't a flying city in space. Hoboken is a densely packed city. It floods frequently during storms, and it has aging and overtaxed infrastructure, which is not good, because it does handle a massive amount of doo-doo and pee-pee. The average person pees about 0.8 to 2 liters a day, and doo-doo is about 100 to 250 grams a day. That means the city produces anywhere from 48,000 to 120,000 liters of pee-pee, and it produces anywhere from 6 to 15,000 kilos of doo-doo. All of this needs to be washed down by roughly 1.8 million to 3.9 million liters of water. Unless, of course, you use jars to collect your own waste because you're afraid of an Arnold Schwarzenegger a six-day-like situation happening to you, which is, you know, pretty valid. I'm going to estimate that the crew of a Star Destroyer at 50,000 is going to be in the mid-range of these estimates. It's a more male-dominated crew. Most are going to be military age and very active, so more calorie and fluid intake, more waste. So that's 84,000 liters of pee and 10,500 kilos of duty. So the amount of wastewater that toilets on the ISD or refreshers as they're called in universe are gonna use is gonna be significantly lower per, per flush than the toilets we have in our houses. And that's because even in the Star Wars galaxy, you're gonna need to conserve water when you're on these giant naval ships that are you know, flying through space. You don't have unlimited resources. Instead of using low flow designs, I imagine the Imperial Navy ships are gonna use vacuum assisted toilet systems that use just one to two liters of water per flush. They actually have these on larger US Navy ships and also on airplanes. And yes, they can suck your intestines out if you sit on them while you flush. It's one of the worst ways to die. So these toilets use about one sixth of the water of a modern low flow toilet. So on an ISD, you can expect about uh, 300,000 liters of water being used daily to flush things into its vacuum sewage system. To visualize that much amount of water, you would need basically 10 fuel trucks lined up side by side. That's how much water. It's quite a lot. So the sewage system in Hoboken works in a pretty standard way uh, for American cities. 
wastewater from toilets collect into pipes into a combined sewer system, which also collects stormwater. As mentioned before, Hoboken floods a lot. Uh, during Hurricane Sandy, the entire city was underwater, and the National Guard had to come and bail people out. And whenever there's heavy rainstorms, certain streets flood as well. The problem with a combined sewage system is, as you guessed, uh, once there's too much rainwater, all that sewage floods out onto the streets, which is why you should never swim in flood water. Now, before the sewers do that, before they back up into the streets, you do have one option. The city can discharge some of the overflow into the Hudson River, which is why you should never swim near a big city after a storm. My editor, Congo, who is now meticulously editing uh, the words I'm saying right now, is probably thinking about the time we kayaked in Boston Harbor after a big rainstorm uh, when we were warned by people to not do that. Yeah, that's my bad. I'm sorry, Congo. Now, Star Destroyer can't have this type of system. Everything does have to be closed, and you can't have overflow into the hallways. Now, one of the big advantages that the Star Wars Galaxy has is that its ships do have artificial gravity, something that our International Space Station does not have. When you don't have gravity, fluids and solids don't function in a normal way, and that's really bad when you're talking about sewage. So, water does not flow naturally because of the gravity, and, and solids don't settle. They kind of just get everywhere. And in this kind of situation, you basically need air suction to make things work. Now, how things work on an Imperial class Star Destroyer is probably going to be closer to how a large modern naval ship works rather than the International Space Station or a city like Hoboken. First, the amount of pipes that are running through the ship are going to be ridiculous. It's going to be a lot. A densely packed city like Hoboken has around 10 to 20 kilometers of pipe for every square kilometer, which means roughly around 55 to 110 kilometers of sewer lines in the city. And according to naval engineering references, a Nimitz class carrier has roughly 8 to 13 kilometers of piping for sewage. I think the amount of sewer pipes in the Imperial class Star Destroyer is going to be somewhere in between there, probably closer to the Hoboken estimates. It should be noted that modern aircraft carriers typically do use vacuum toilets, uh, these are going to use a lot less water, and also the diameter of the pipes are going to be a lot smaller. Basically, each toilet creates a partial vacuum with a seal of some kind. The pipes are negative pressure, which is created by a vacuum pump, which creates all that suction inside of the tube. The entire sewage system runs from the heads to these large storage tanks where you have black water. Black water is usually just nasty, untreated wastewater. These systems need to be completely sealed. You can't have any leaks anywhere, and that includes the individual toilets themselves. This makes maintenance extremely complicated for these type of systems. You can make them kind of modular and have redundancy as well to make it a little easier to repair so that the entire system doesn't break if there's just one small leak. Now, there's some pretty big advantages to this type of system, especially if we're talking about a ship like the Imperial Class Star Destroyer. If the ship loses gravity or it's forced to do some extreme maneuvers that the inertial compensators can't handle, the sewer system will still function properly because it does not rely on gravity. You also have less of a chance of clogs happening inside of these pipes, and they tend to be cleaner because of that there's less corrosion inside because things are getting blasted through, you know, with pressure and vacuum. For an Imperial Class Star Destroyer to function properly, we're looking at kilometers and kilometers of pipes spreading from all of the heads on the ship. You have individual officer rooms with private toilets to larger crew barracks, which might have their own attached toilets to even more cramped hot bunk areas with large communal bathrooms. You'll need different types of systems, different types of piping for each type of bathroom. The size of an Imperial class Star Destroyer is massive, right? It's the size of Hoboken, essentially, so it makes sense that you would have multiple storage units for the Blackwater in different areas, just so, again, you can make the system more modular so that if one part of the ship breaks, you, you still have toilets in other parts of the ship. You know, sewage backing up in a sealed vessel with recycled air and water can be extremely awful and even dangerous. The amount of bacteria and odor that can spread through an environment like this is horrifying. Actually, one of the most ingenious acts of sabotage during World War II was carried out by Norwegian resistance against the German Navy. They basically intercepted a shipment of sardines and filled the tins of sardines not with olive oil or vegetable oil, but with croton oil, which really is not for human consumption. I mean, the internet says it is used as a laxative, but uh, it sounds like it burns your insides, your throat, your intestines, your stomach, your butthole. And yes, it creates explosive diarrhea and explosive vomiting that is so bad that um, you can die from just ingesting a small amount of this liquid. So yeah, they sent that into the, into the rations of U-boats. I can imagine a World War II destroyer crew listening to the hydrophones, hearing the faint cries of Germans begging for a depth charge to kill them because U-boats uh, often had difficulty flushing their waste systems while they were submerged in deep water. Some of the older models still used buckets.
Now, you would think that the best way to get rid of waste on a Star Destroyer would be to just shoot it out into space. Most liquids would basically flash evaporate because of vacuum. But still having all of that evaporated material, you know, like poop crystals and clouds of urine, that can contaminate the outside of the ship if you're not careful. And that's not a good idea. And also from an image point of view, it would hurt the Imperial Navy's fearsome image. I mean, just imagine an Imperial class Star Destroyer flying over a city with a giant shit stain on it. You're sending mixed signals at, at that point. Also, you're gonna be wasting a lot of water if you're just ejecting sewage into space and even the Imperial Navy needs to conserve these types of resources. This is why the Imperial class Star Destroyer actually features a state-of-the-art water recycling plant on board. Now, in modern aircraft carriers, when sewage is uh, piped into vacuum tubes to a holding tank for black water. The water is generally treated. Usually you have some type of uh, macerator pump that uses blades to grind up solid waste or toilet paper into a slurry, which then is screened and filtered and treated with chemicals like chlorine or bromine compounds to reduce odor and of course kill harmful bacteria. Just enough treatment so that it is safe enough to dump this water, sewage water, into the ocean. It's not quite as complex as what we see in municipal water treatment centers that have multiple stages that clean the water to a point where it becomes potable again. Now, it should be noted that an aircraft carrier has a desalination plant on board that converts ocean water into drinkable fluids. Desalination is a very expensive process. It's a very uh, energy intensive process, but because aircraft carriers have nuclear power plants on them, that's not really a problem. So. What the ISD has to rely on as far as waste management is probably closer to the International Space uh, Program's closed loop system, which also is designed not to waste water. This system is designed to recycle everything, including sweat and uh, breath condensation. If you guys have ever been camping during the winter, you'll know that like a lot of water leaves your mouth when you're sleeping at night. So how do astronauts uh, not waste water? Well, in the ISS, they have to literally strap themselves onto what's known as a universal waste management system. This thing has foot restraints and handholds, and the idea is to form a tight seal with your butt so that the vacuum pump can suck all that waste into you know a tube, which is then separated into either a water recovery system for purification or the solid doo-doo is vacuum sealed into individual bags and sold on NASA's online gift shop as moon rocks. The water recovery system basically uh, boils all the water in vacuum. Again, in vacuum, uh, boiling rate for water is very low. And so it's like a distillation process where you get all this water vapor separated and what's left is turned into like kind of a brine like material which has all the impurities from urine actually in 2016 a brine processor assembly was added to the iss that extracts even more water from the leftover material giving the space station an impressive 98 percent recovery of water the distilled water vapor is then pressed through a series of mechanical filters which removes impurities and then it's run through a catalytic reactor at high temperatures which destroys any remaining organic compounds and then Iodine is actually added to the water as it sits in storage so that it stabilizes and no you know, bacteria grows while in the tank. The water returns back to the system and is consumed by astronauts and I'm told it does not taste good. Imagine that the Imperial class Star Destroyer has a hybrid system for water treatment on board, probably a multi-stage water treatment facility that has resting pools which utilize gravity to separate impurities from water as long as the uh, gravity on the ship is working well. And then you have chemical treatment that's done to what's left followed probably by the use of distillation, either using vacuum or just high temperature to fully clean liquids. This could also allow the ISD to harvest ice and water on foreign planets, even asteroids to supplement their water supply. All of these things are reasonably feasible to do because of the massive fusion reactor on board the ship, which essentially gives the ISD unlimited energy. When we take a look at giant warships like the ISD, we oftentimes criticize stupid design choices like the lack of weapons and placements here and there, blind spots. I commonly do it on this channel for sure, but sometimes we forget that these are very complicated ships to design and that there are actually a lot of systems on these ships that are impressive that we should take notice. Things like an integrated sewage system on board that basically takes care of the waste of 50,000 people. Yes, it might not be as exciting as the turbo lasers or the onboard uh, complement to TIE fighters, but the reality is without this type of waste management system, living on an ISD would be unbearable and extremely unsanitary. Oftentimes, it is the little things that make a Navy work proper. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.